Hey everyone, Thomas Aarons with Fishing the DMV here with a couple of special announcements. We have finally created a Patreon. Now you can support our show and help us make this thing bigger and better. Some of the special perks that you're going to get is an extra monthly podcast just for you, an assortment of live streams just for you where you can ask me questions that no one else can ask, and you're going to get 5% off all of your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Now we have something that's on the scheduling front. Starting the first week of September, we're going to have our Monday night live streams as always. That'll be re-uploaded as a podcast on Tuesday. And on Thursday morning, we'll be bringing you a normal podcast episode. Now, once we hit 300 Patreon supporters, I'm going to increase the amount of podcast episodes back to the level that we're at now. Three fantastic Fishing the DMV podcast episodes with tons of fishing reports and cool guests, a live stream, and also we're going to be bringing you much more content. But to find out the idea of where we're trying to take this channel, please go visit my Patreon page. And even if you don't want to subscribe as a Patreon, I have it listed all of our goals and our hopes to make this thing the best fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. How's everybody doing this weekend? Labor Day weekend is in full swing. How many of you actually braved out to get out on the water? I, I know most of the places near me have been absolutely jam-packed with boats. People that are trying to get in that one more summertime ride on, the, on their jet ski or their, or their wake boat. Uh, it was pretty crazy this weekend for me. So I did not decide to go out fishing at all. I did go out on Thursday, though. Got to fish the Thursday nighters. I think the last, yeah, this last one was at Big Slack, actually, which was a lot of fun. We got second place. I missed Big Fish by ounces. I think Big Fish for here was like three pounds on the dot, and I was like at 299, 298, something like that. Weights aren't great. I mean, the place fish is kind of like the Ohio River. You know, you catch a three pounder, that's a big old pig, but it's still a lot of fun, especially when it's only like, 10 minutes from my house. I really enjoy that. Uh, yeah, before we get into it tonight, as always, guys, in the comment section down below, please let me know how the audio is before we kind of get going with this episode here. Uh, I'll be throwing throwing some links up here shortly with, with the call in numbers. Hey, Shane, how are you doing? Let me know how the audio sounds right now tonight. Because uh, we got a really good show for everybody here. Audio, uh, see, Jay Love, audio sounds perfect. Sweet. Okay, perfect. So since audio sounds good, we can kind of just get into her here. Put that up there. Perfect. Audio sounds great. David Williams, how are you doing tonight, bud? Uh, Scott went out Saturday. Water levels way too low. Yeah, the whole Shenandoah Basin area is under a huge drought right now. So it's really hard. I know the Shenandoah Valley has been hit really hard. I also just want to say, hey, there's my co-angler or my backup when my wife can't fish. Curtis Cole, what's up, dude? Good to see you tonight, dude. Uh, also, I want to say a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters out there. I really appreciate it. Uh, we have swelled over to over 20 in less than a week, which has been absolutely awesome. I'm going to be bringing out more content specifically for all my Patreon supporters. Again, if you if you don't know about it, we just started a Patreon. We have a goal to one day start our own nonprofit to actually do supplemental stocking in Virginia and Maryland. We got permission from all the different DBWR agencies. We're allowed to do it. We have the green light, but first we're trying to hit some of our goals to actually do that to where we can go into places and do supplemental stocking, hopefully, uh, and help out the fisheries. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun if we can get to that tonight. So anyway, we got a really, a really, really cool show for you. We, we got a call in show and we're going to be talking about some of these issues with, I don't even know if these issues, the drama, the juice surrounding forward facing sonar. I kind of been out of it the last couple of weeks. So I haven't, I've been trying to catch up on what's been going on, but apparently it has absolutely blown up with all the memes. You probably have seen them. Uh, it's been posted everywhere. And I think it really kind of delves back to, if you look at Lake Champlain, the St. Lawrence river, uh, late St. Clair, all these smallmouth derbies, you know, the past month or two where people have been really using their forward facing sonar. And from there, the memes and the comments online have gotten very uh, commutative, passionate regarding forward facing sonar. And so today, I don't think this has been done before. I wanted to do a call in show. I wanted to get people's opinions and thoughts on it. So, you know, without, you know, kind of without further ado there, 
I'm going to drop a couple of things. I got a link. If you want to come on with your face or if you want to call into the show, there you go. You guys can come on. You can leave a voicemail if you would like to. I'm going to drop the number right here. The number is 240-542-9877. And you can kind of give your thoughts on everything. I, I don't know. if sh- There's probably already been a couple of shows that have done this. So I'm probably a little bit late to it. But I want to get everyone's thoughts on how forward fa- what they think of forward-facing sonar. I think, and we've got Shane right here with a good comment. If you're going to fish the circuit by by live scope, if you're going to fish the circuit by live scope, I mean, eh, yeah, I mean, that's what I want to get into tonight. I see everyone's opinions on live scope, what where the, they think this is going to go. And I think one thing we have to look at is just the technology side of things. You know, in in 2004, 2005, Hummingbird first came to market with three with side scan. Uh, side scan first came to market. Then, at that point. Everyone thought that was like a complete game changer. It's it's nuts how that's going to change the whole industry up. And then in 2017, you know, all tricks came out with spot lock. You know, this idea that you could actually have your trolling motor hook up to uh, GPS and keep you right on a spot the whole time. And then Garmin came out with, with Panoptics in 2015-ish area. And so if you look at this, like there's always been the steady drumbeat of technology kind of coming in to fishing and kind of changing the way we do it. Just to give you some context of how this all worked up. Oh, it looks like we got our first caller here. All right, let's see. Caller, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. All right, so since I do not have caller ID, could you, uh, what's your name and uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm Zach Schrock and I'm from Waynesville, Maryland. Oh, how you doing, Zach? Good. So what are your thoughts? What's that? What are your thoughts on the whole uh, forward-facing sonar stuff? Yeah, I use I use first pers- I personally use uh, forward-facing sonar myself. What do you think about it? Um, I like I don't think it's like yes, it's an advantage, but you can't really like make the fish bite like the bait and stuff, and like you can, you can see them and like you can see how they react to your bait and like I mean. I don't think they should ban it, like the major tournament circuits and stuff. And like, I don't know. It's just like, it's not really that much of an advantage. Like you can see the fish, but you just can't make them bite. And especially when you're fishing that shallow, shallow water, especially like on like the Potomac River and stuff, like it doesn't really matter, like if you're using it or not. Well, honestly, I think you're a great person to have on to talk about this. Let's pretend that I just woke up from a coma the last year. What is the controversy surrounding it? And how did this, all the memes get going? Do you kind of understand all that that's going on on social media? Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand from like a co- co-English perspective, because like they can't see it, because like the voter can um, turn it off like on the back screen from their console. But I mean, it's just part of being a coach, to be honest. Why do you think it's not as big of a deal compared to like when you look at people online saying their you know their uh their passionate view of it? Where do you think that comes from? I mean, can you repeat that? So why is there so much hate around forward facing sonar? Like, what what are your vibes on that? Um, I think it's because like you have the guys out there that's like never used it before, and they've seen the pit, like the videos and stuff, like the old videos when forward facing sonar first came out. And you could you could definitely like tell a difference between fishing without it and fishing with it back then, but nowadays like the fish can tell like when the forward facing is on, the fish can feel that in the water, and like I like when I was in Florida and I was um, using my forward facing sonar, I was fishing like six foot of water, and this is in January because we were fishing around grass flats, throwing like a jerk bait and like it was like six to twelve foot of water, and we were throwing jerk baits and stuff like flipping through the grass and I mean. Around grass, it's not really like that much of a big deal. I, I definitely think there's more nuance to it um, versus all the hate that it's getting. And I think that's, I'm really glad I got somebody on the show to talk about the, the pros of it. Because when I came up with this idea, I thought it would just be a shit talking on forward facing sonar for two hours. So, Zach, I'm really glad you started off the show with somebody in the pro camp because I kind of wanted to have a balanced approach to this. So, you know, thank you so much for coming on. Um, if this is a good number, I'm going to text you after the show. You're going to get a $5 gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. All right. 
But hey, thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. I really appreciate it. Um, you're gotten to start off with this Monday Night Live. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Talk to you later, bud. Yeah, thank you. Bye. All right, guys. That was our first guest. I was act okay. Not gonna lie, I was shocked. I really did think you now he might be the only guy that's gonna be for it to balance this argument out. But uh, that's a good start. So, and we also have somebody else in here to talk about the forward facing sonar. I'm gonna bring him into the queue right now. Yeah, where we go, Shane. You got the phone. Hey, Thomas, how are you tonight? I'm doing wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, you have forward facing sonar. This will be fun to get your opinion on it. Um, yeah. What do you think is going on with it just blowing up with all the hate? It feels like it came out of nowhere or it it really blew up with the amount of hate that seemed like it got online. Yeah, I, I think it's been building up for a while. And there's a few pros. Um, I'm not going to mention their names. So I'm not going to give them props. But I have I follow a few that they just they just will not, you know, bend. They're like, it's cheating, it's cheating, it's cheating. They're losing, they're losing, they're losing. It's their money, right? Um, so they started a trend and they even sell merchandise, you know, stickers, you know, live, live scope sucks, things of that nature. Instead of trying it and understanding the technology, um, they've got enough momentum now to try to ban it. You know, that's part of what they're trying to get done is get it banned. It's just like everything in, in life, right? We, we evolve with technology and fishing has evolved year after year after year. There's going to be there's going to be the next thing after live scope. You and I both know it, mm -hmm. but um, it's if you know. I said said in the comments earlier. If you're going to fish the major the major circuits, BAS, MLF, whatever circuit you're going to fish, everyone's winning, and for the most part with live scope, right? They they use it to their advantage. Now, I'll, I'll I'll give an example. Last year, I went down and fished the Lunkers Championship tournament on um, Lake Fall, Alabama. I came in third place and got big bass. I never turned live scope one on one time, right? So there's a there's but you've been on my boat. I've got it, mm -hmm. right? So I know how to use it when I need to use it, but I also understand how to fish. I know where the fish are, time of years, and you know my fishing experience comes in. So if you combine your fishing experience with the technology, uh, and not just depend on one or the other, I think it makes you a better fisher. Um, I, yeah, I hundred percent. I got it on my boat this year. Um, I have the gruesome twosome. I have now mega 360 and I also have, you know, uh, forward facing sonar. And it, I think when people watch the commercials and I'm going to say they, they sold this thing perfectly that you'll be able to see every single fish and you drop the lure right in front of them and you're going to catch, you know, 30 pounds each time. They sold that very well from a marketing standpoint. Absolutely. But honestly, how many times I fished this year where I, it's not that I saw them. I just, it made my, my decision process so much faster. You scan yeah. around a cove and there's nothing there. I'm gone. I'm bouncing. Yep. You don't see activity. You can process information. They're stuck to the bottom. I shouldn't be throwing a jerk bait. I should be like hitting it with a shaky head or something. Yep. That's where I think a lot of pros, they don't talk about that, that part of it. It's the marking that you see when you go to St. Clair, you go to like Champlain, the perfect places to video game fish. And then that's where people's minds are sold versus when you have tournaments that it really is just such a smaller factor into it. And I think that's another part of this conversation as well that you don't hear about as much. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it does. It shortens your decision making process when you're out there on the lake. No doubt about it. But what you're, the caller prior to you said is just because you see them doesn't mean you catch them. Right. And that's really, really true. When they're not biting, they're not biting. Um, you know, a cold front moves through and you may, and if you're lucky enough to see them, cause usually they're stuck on the bottom. And when bass are right on the bottom, it's hard to pick them out on live scope. But if you do pick one or two out, it doesn't mean you're going to bite. They're not going to bite. You know, the conditions matter. Um, but I, I do think that the marketing, like you said, the marketing is a, is a big, is a big factor. But also when you think about people, and I've heard this and I, and I understand this cause I'm guilty of this. No one wants to watch bass fishing and just watch people looking down at the screen, right? And I'm guilty from this time to time. I just, I just edited a video for the channel, and I was like, I'm going to make it sure if I can avoid putting something out where I'm just looking down at the screen. I don't want to, you know, because it becomes a habit. Right? Mm -hmm. look down, so. it, it becomes a habit, and that, again, if you don't want that on all of your tournaments, it's about scheduling. I mean, this happened... 
Oh Lord, Chad, help me out. When, when Kentucky Lake was really big and ledge fishing was huge, the uh, FLW had a tournament where you had two guys on a ledge and they had an argument and the guy just left championship day and he was leading huge confrontation. And that's because you scheduled an event during a ledge fishing bite when this would be an issue. And again, I'm not saying you can fix it completely, but one thing you can do is try to schedule events when live scope wouldn't be as much of a factor. Right. Boom. You can solve a lot of that right there. Yeah. What the thing that's interesting to me, what are people's, th I feel like people don't understand how complex this issue actually is where, okay, if you could, I'm just going to take this side of the argument here, just, to, just for this analogy, you get rid of live scope and you, and you put a cap on all the technology. Great. How much of the industry is made up of brands that actually promote technology? What will that do to the industry? If you tell Lawrence, Garmin, Hummingbird, Minn Kota, all these things, like we have to put a cap on this. You can't sell this. Do you think that's going to push more money or less money in and out of the industry to hurt all these guys? Cause you're not, you're not making a living on winnings. It's basically sponsor driven, which means it's technology driven. You have to sell right. the next thing. Right. There is definitely a second and third order effect that they have to think through. And I think, you know, BASS, the major tournaments are really considering all that because a lot of that, a lot of that money flows from these companies for their sales and things of that nature. So yes, you gotta be careful what you ask for. Um, and, and, you know, just a little local leagues. I mean, one of the local electric only leagues down here, I can't fish because I have live scope and that's fine. There's another league that I will fish. Mm -hmm. that does a lot. So maybe that's the answer. Maybe you just design a non-technology league, just at the competitive level, at the pro level, see how many people sign up for that and yeah. let, let the system weed out, right? Let capitalism do its thing. I agree with that. I, and that's another, that's another part of this thing that we need to have is okay. Ban it. Well, crappy fishing already does this where you do, like you said, you have scope events and non-scope, but the professionals guys, you know, they have to have it. If, if, if the technology is allowed to exist at all, the pros have to have the best stuff because they're the ones that are going to sell it. That's a hundred percent. I think yeah. we should all agree on that yeah. and they can all afford it. So I don't, I don't understand that part of it, I guess, when yeah. you, when you have to do that. And the example I see with a lot of this is, um, I guess cause I was in baseball for, for so long as a coach and as a trainer before they had BB core regulations, uh, which was basically the velocity in which the ball could come off the bat. Right. They made baseball bats that were insanely hot and the prices started to get up there where, you know, inflation today, those bats, if, if you bought one of those bats now, it'd probably be like a thousand bucks. Right. for a little league bat. And you'd be like, why would you do that? Because Timmy could weigh six pounds and he could hit a ball over 300 feet. It was insane. The technology bloomed. So they cited safety reasons, which is probably true because the, the baseball bats were getting too hot. So they capped it. Well, here's the issue when you capped it. At that point, you're buying a product that's not as good, sure. but you're still having to pay high-end prices. And there was a huge dip in sales for a while they got around it in little league because they declared that if it's not a brand new bat you can't use it but the point was there was a real shift in the marketing for a couple of years because it's like you have to buy a the next generation bat but you know it sucks it's not as good right if you cap all this technology it's going to be interesting to see how that would affect the industry for a couple of years um and i know people think that's boring and, and not to care about that but it's a factor people really need to think about. And, and then the last thing, and I'll, I'll stop talking here. I'll get your opinion. Why is it people are complaining about this, but not about boat prices being $200,000? <laughs> well, that, that makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, the, the second part of that is, is if you can afford a $200,000 bass boat and you don't throw a $1,500 live scope on it, <laughs> come on <laughs> it, it, that's blowing my mind that people are saying it's too expensive it's one more thing but they're okay with mortgaging their home and their future for a brand new phoenix and like that seems a little squirrely to me like how that is yeah you know i was just thinking uh, uh you know not trying to get around to another part of the live scope thing you know when you talk about the industry a lot of lure companies are now saying building lures that yep. you can see better on live scope so again, back to the, you know, other effects of the industry. And I think we're making better leaders today, right? Um, so you, you, if you pause the live scope, you cut down the live scope or cap it or whatever you want to look or ban it, what else are we doing to the lure market? Mm -hmm. How, what we catch our fish on? So that's something to think about as well.
Now, on the other end of the spectrum, eventually, do we need to have a technology cap on fishing? Like NASCAR has caps on their engine power and things like that. Is that something we should look at, guys? I mean, let me know in the comment section down below or you can call in. But I, I think at some point there will have to be a technology cap. I just don't know what the heck that would look like. Yeah, I remember I, reading BASS magazine when I was a young kid and they talked about and I, I can I can even see the graphics in my mind today. Um, they talked about being able to see the fish under the water. That came true. The other thing they talked about was lures that could find fish. You throw it out there, give it slack, and it could find fish. That might be <laughs> that might be a game changer that we'd have to be able to th you know have to think about because that technology kind of already exists in other areas of technology where they can seek things out, right? Um, if you mastered that and just was able to throw, I'm just making this up, a little strike bait out there and it was able to go towards the fish, like had mm -hmm. built in sonar, whew, that would be, yeah, that, that, that could be a major game changer. And that was in Bassmaster Magazine in like 1984, That's freaking insane. Yeah. Yeah, and if you guys look at it too, I mean, again, you can Google this all yourself, but like an all trucks trolling motor really came, I think it came to market in 2017 and people thought like this was a very big luxury item. And now it seems like every boat has one now. Almost everyone has some kind of spotlight trolling, not everyone, but a good majority of the population. And that's six years. And I think Garmin really came to their, their panoptics in 2015, 16. And now everyone has it within the last two years. So we're not even 10 years with forward facing sonar. So it is interesting to see this lull of, is this just a flash in the pan? Like every time a new technology comes or is this legitimately something that's going to be happening? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And you know, the, the one thing you had to really think about too, is um, if we're going to limit things, should they be, cause you're talking about these 200,000 on the bass boat speed up safety is always an issue right no matter what people die i was i heard about some guys dying in a tournament in seminole speeding past if you've been, been on lake seminole it's narrow some of the channels you gotta get through they hit in a high school tournament killed two teenagers if you're going to think about safety that's the first thing i would consider if you're going to cap something maybe engine size speed etc um but how you could tie forward facing sonar in this safety or I, that would be a tough one but i think the cap needs to come uh you need to look at keeping boaters and fishermen safe first if you're going to limit something and then thomas has a great question here thomas ruby in baseball we don't let pros use aluminum bats that's technology the idea is to even the playing field at the professional level so let's 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 come let's break that down so the analogy i meant was basically you look how an industry got affected when they put in regulations on technology so the whole idea with the baseball bat industry is technology is what sold you buying a more expensive bat because it gave you an advantage so from this this thing here is like well why is it pros don't do it the biggest thing is safety reasons 100 percent. so forward facing sonar there's no safety issue there right, right. now a professional right. athlete using an aluminum bat that is reason why they put the restrictions in is because it was getting dangerous as well now if you're going to be talking about just the technology and making it even there i understand what you're saying with 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 wooden bats i, I think the the better thing there when you're talking about any an even playing field is kind of with nascar is a better thing where each car now has a limit on everything it has so there is a competitive advantage there and they used to do that in bass fishing with the Bassmaster classic back i think the last year was 2005 or four where everyone had the same boats same amount of tackle i think that's what will make the most people happy is you say this is the budget you can spend this amount on your boat yeah. boom yeah that that's probably a good approach and if you if you want to put live scope on it and stay under budget you know yeah. and not put in a three or four rod and reels that's your choice yeah because like I, I mean i get and that's the thing is too is like to me optically as a marketing team the live scope is not what kills it it's when you see 50 graphs on the front of that damn thing dude that's a lot of money like you can have one graph on the front and the back of your boat and have a lot of technology and it doesn't look as bad as when you see three or four on the front it's just like good lord yeah we're talking a lot about live scope though but a lot of bass fishermen they have three screens mm -hmm. around their console and they they are side scanning they're down scanning they're they're using all the technology combined to locate bass and i know how to do it on side scan i matter of fact i cruised around on saturday and found some bass on side scan so it's not just 
live scope that can help you find fish. Now, you live scope is going to help you pinpoint, but it's not all the technology combined is how these fishermen are out there, you know, competing, and that's what they have to use to be, you know, be competitive. I mean, they got big screens on there. It, it, it's at, and that, and that is a competitive advantage. And the other thing too, guys, if you want to talk about money and where money goes, and another one, um, uh, the article, uh, I think it's Chris Johnson was talking about this, where it comes down to, is it too much of a competitive advantage? That is such a vague lawyer statement of, yeah. okay, is knowledge a competitive advantage? You say you want to ban live scope maybe at the BFL level, but you're allowed a pro angler come down. Isn't that a competitive advantage to be a pro angler? What if you're a guide? That's a very vague thing to have an argument with of like competitive advantage. Cause where does that, where does that lead? Cause you want to ban live scope that everyone can buy. But if you're a pro with the knowledge, that's a competitive advantage that's allowed. So I just feel like that gets really into the weeds. If, if that's going to be kind of the argument there. Oh my God, we have a lot of questions on this. Yeah. I knew this was going to be a hot topic. Uh, uh, Western mid Bassin. We, uh, we fish the Thursday evening tournaments as well. And you won a tournament with live scope, but the last tournament was won by a guy putting, 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 the putting on the tournament who didn't even have a depth finder um it's luck and angler skill and it comes down yeah I mean, it comes down to that and, and then western that's a good question i'm not catching a lot of fish with the live scope though especially on that part of the river the bigger ones at least where we were fishing they're pressed to the bottom what i'm looking at more of like is just bait fish activity um if i see that the area is like dead and there's nothing moving around i'm not going to catch anything yeah. Um, yeah, I've caught two fish last, last night, last Thursday, I caught one that I saw on the graph, uh, the tournament I won, I caught none of them looking on the graph. So again, I think that's also an issue there where it's very, it's misleading that people assume if you have live scope, clearly you catch every damn fish. Cause you're looking at your screen with that is that's not true at all. It, it, it's really not. Um, let's get a couple through one of these questions. And then, you know what, guys, I'm gonna throw up this number here. Cause I know I have like a ton of people texting me right now that want to get on the show. Uh, two, four, two, four, zero, five, four, two, nine, eight, seven, seven. Also the link is there as well. If you want to hop on the show and give your piece about the forward facing center thing as well. Uh, again, guys also give uh, Shane Flint outdoors a link. He also runs, I'm just going to say the world's largest online tournament organization until he tells me differently. <laughs> <laughs> largest in the United States. Largest in the United States so far. He will be going to Thailand and Singapore soon as well. If he can. <laughs> Uh, and then you have a tournament going on right now, correct? Can people? Yeah, we have a smallmouth slam going on right now. It's just smallmouth bass only. Um, it ends on the uh, 10th of September, and then our fall slam, as we call it, is a team tournament. So you can join. It's a six-week tournament. Um, your teammate does not have to be in the boat. It can be a virtual teammate anywhere in the United States. Um, it's a really cool format. And if you want to learn more, you can go to my YouTube channel, and I got a, a, a video on the format of how it's going to be. We keep it competitive. So if you live in Florida and or you live in Maine, the way we put our formats together, it makes it competitive around the United States. That's freaking awesome, dude. I really appreciate that. Um, again, guys, you know, please give him a follow. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Shane, thank you so much. I'm going to keep yeah. cycling people on here. Uh, again, guys, give him a follow. Link in the episode description. Uh, thank you so much, boss. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon, bud. Talk to you later. Now that that's guys is is really interesting there and that's some really good um let's see we just got just called in all right yeah guys uh please call into the show again uh i my phone line has been absolutely jammed uh please feel free to to call in again leave a voicemail um good lord my line is packed right now we have over 35 people watching i've had six people already call in all at the same time if it goes to voicemail that's because somebody's already on the sh are already on the show here We have, sorry, we have five people calling at the same time. And my poor wife is running back and forth with the camera right now. Uh, I'm going to get through some of these chats while we get this next thing hooked up right now. Yeah. Yeah. Call. Yeah. Put him on. You're putting on Phil. Hey, caller. Hey, hey, caller. Who is this? This is Boyd Duckett Jr. Hi, Boyd. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. I just wanted to, um, you know, I heard you were talking about, you know, forward facing sonar potentially being banned. And I just wanted to let you know, I gave a $5 million grant to Garmin, uh, to continue developing technology. And I gave another $2 million grant to MLF, 
um, to keep doing what they're doing. So I, I think we shouldn't have any problems, and we're gonna have smooth sailing from here on out. Uh, so what 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 possessed you to really want to give out this grant? Well, you know, I mean, what's good for Alton Jones Jr. and and Jacob Wheeler and everybody? What's good for them is what's good for me. So, you know, I just want to see the the technology continuing to advance, and I want to see the the bag weights continue to go up, and you know, hopefully, uh, the view, the viewership will rise. So, so boy, do you run live scope on your boat? Absolutely. What what are some absolutely pieces? I got I've got five transducers on there. I've got um two on the front trolling motor. I've got uh two solid mountain ones on the back, and I have another one at the console seat. Um just so I can watch, you know, while I'm running. How many fish are you giving cancer to? That's a lot of uh of transponders and uh, transducers and graphs on that boat well the science isn't necessarily out on that yet but you know i'm holding a phone here that's bringing in 5g waves so i mean i might as well give the fish cancer too while i'm at it <laughs> boy thank you uh, so much i mean before before i let you go here uh what do you think about the the drama between mlf and bass Oh, you know, I'm not too worried about it. I think, um, you know, I think, I think Bass is uh, getting a little complacent, and I think they're going to lose some of their best anglers to us here before long. And you know, I, I've heard of these guys, Matt Strike and Hunter Smith, are coming up through the BFL series, and um, I think they're going to fish their way up to the Toyotas and get on the Pro Tour. And uh, they're going to bring a lot of new fans, a lot of new coverage to the sport, um, more specific, specifically to MLF. And uh, I think we'll be just fine. I, th I think Bass is digging their own grave. Boyd, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show and giving your two cents worth on uh, forward-facing sonar. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's no problem. I mean, you've got my phone number. If you have any questions about, uh, you know, any of this stuff or tournament rules or what, what Boyd Senior is eating for dinner, you can give me a call anytime. Boyd, I can't appreciate it. Thank you so much, and I'll be talking to you later. Everyone, Boyd Jr., everybody, thank you. Yeah, have a good one. All right, guys. So I was not expecting that phone call tonight. That was very interesting. Uh, we got a couple more people here calling in. I got, I think this is one of the mats. Uh, I, I, I am, I'm giving guys, we got another really good guest for you right here. This is, uh, I'm sorry. I'm a little taken aback oh. by, I got, I can't believe I got Boyd Duckett on this show. This was quite amazing. Uh, Matt, how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing great. I can't believe Boyd Duckett knows my name. Knows who I am. Me and Hunter both. You guys are absolutely famous. The fact that Boyd Duckett somehow got my phone number and knows you guys. You're you're going places in the world. I can't believe it. I'm blown away. The fact that he's running those six, uh, yeah, live scope black boxes. I mean, the the freaking cancer he's giving all the fish in his lake. But he must know some kind of secret. I heard he had eight, but it could be I eight. Don't know. That, that yeah, absolutely. Um. So as I get my composure back here, so. Yeah, I mean, what what are your what are your thoughts about this whole thing? I saw a couple of the things that you posted on um, on your short feed, on, I think on Instagram, which was a really cool. I don't know if it was you, but I'll give you credit for it, showing the history of looking at your graph and things like that. Yeah, that was me. The other day, I woke up at like four in the morning and I wasn't fishing, and I saw Randy Blockett's post, and it was just like, all right, dude, I'm over it. I remember watching dudes video game fish when I was in high school. Like back in 2007, 2008. And it's literally nothing new, especially for the Northern Swing tournaments. And I guess if you want to say it's boring to watch, I guess it is. And that's something I think is more on the broadcasting side than the angler side. But I don't know. I had to post some of those videos because I've just always remembered it. I always thought it was so cool. I mean, watching Aaron Martin, some of those guys back in the day, like just looking at a 2D sonar and that you could actually snipe fish is, 
I mean, first off, good Lord, we've come a long way with technology. <laughs> I mean, I, I would not have the patience now with my ADHD brain to do that. And, and you hit on something interesting. And I kind of I brought it up earlier with, with the Altrex trolling motor where few people had a spot lock. And now it, it seems like every boat comes with spot lock. And maybe this is just it. We always complain at the newest technology. That's what we were good at is complaining. I think that's what it is because you kind of saw the same thing with side imaging, right? When that came out, people wanted that band too. It, it, it is. And, and what's so crazy to me, and this is something I've learned now that I have it on my boat is people always assume because you have that clearly, that's all you use. Now, granted you and, and maybe, you know, Mr. McCluskey, like you guys definitely are way more proficient at it, but it's interesting that you automatically assume, you know, he has live scope. Clearly it's almost like that's the reason he's good. I, I guess is kind of the thought process people have. Mm, maybe. I mean, that might be people's initial thought. I know that's not true because mm. the dude was winning Fountainhead tournaments before LiveScope was out. So you can't really place that skill like directly with the LiveScope. I remember going out with him before he had it, like maybe a year and a half before he had it. And it was like July and we went out and just his skill of even reading the 2D or his down imaging and side imaging is uh, pretty phenomenal like that we had a sick day out on the res and it was all like he was just calling the shots we'd side scan a point or see it on down he'd like be like oh that's a spoon fish right there pick up a spoon turn around flip it out to where that fish was and catch it like very impressive and very sick i really do appreciate um did you see that post uh josh douglas made a couple days ago about it no, I didn't. So he talked about how, like, I've, I'm going to, guys, I'm going to just basically try to paraphrase it. Go look. You, comment section, you know, I'm going to say this wrong. Um, basically, everyone had live scope at Lake Champlain and, and, and we all sucked. So what does that mean? Because therefore, if I have it, I should be fishing better. And it, I thought that was interesting the way, again, he rewarded that. Yeah, if everyone has it, it really doesn't come down to the deciding factor. It really comes back to your fishing skill. And I think that's interesting that you do need to break it down between the professional levels and the lower levels. If you were going to do some kind of law or legislation, it would have to be broken down between the professionals, you know, the triple A, double A and single A systems, because yeah, if everyone gets it and everyone has it at that point, it becomes, are you good at using it? And then your fishing ability, it does neutralize it completely. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. It's like, are there any pros right now fishing that do not have a forward facing sonar unit? Like, do you know if there are, I think in crappie fishing, there is, I know crappie fishing. It's big where you have leagues that are like with live scope and without. And then I think I heard that my Thursday night league, I guess possibly is going to be getting rid of live scope next year. I could be mistaken. So, you know, let me know in the comment section down below guys. Uh, you'll let me know for sure. If I'm wrong about that. Um, I don't know. And, and I had a, I had, I had a Chris Johnson who runs a Potomac guide service. And he talked about like, well, one of the things that came up is in unfair advantage. Um, and I think that's just a vague ass term to say, cause it's like, okay, well, what if you're a guide that can shotgun tournaments? Is that an unfair advantage? Would Matt McCluskey say like, Oh, you've won here, you know, 20 years in a row. That's an unfair advantage. Now. Like, I don't like that as the only excuse unfair advantage because professionals can jackpot bfls and that's okay but you can't buy forward facing sonar because that's bad for a co-angler i don't know that doesn't line up well in my brain yeah no i agree with you 100 percent. i mean i it is obviously and i don't want to say like it's an advantage to have but it, the thing is it's like available to everyone at this point like it's not even overly expensive you can buy even if it's a LBS 32 with a black box. Like you can find them used for like 700 bucks, which yes, that is a decent amount of money, but you know, for the whole thing, you can get into it with a nine inch graph, which goes on sale brand new for like 600 every four months or something. Um, and you can find a used live scope. So you're looking under what? 1500 bucks, 1300 bucks. You can get into it. And I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a lot of guys that don't have it that have never truly used it. Like they might've gone out on someone's boat and watched them catch a bunch of fish on it or something. But like, I don't know the people that complain about it. I just don't think truly use it. 
Uh, well, this is so uh, I, I don't know if this guy's related to Boy Jucket Jr., but uh, Phil Mahegan says boomers are terrified of young guns that are extremely proficient with electronics. Uh, Phil, that is very there's some wisdom right there in those words, bud. There's some really good wisdom there. Uh, let's see, Jared Mounts, sure. it's a tool, it can help you find fish and catch fish. I've always heard many examples of pros and amateur anglers watch a hundred fish, check out their lure, and they only catch three of those. And and I think, Matt, you've talked about that agnosium on your channel, where if you're sniping fish, it's not like you're catching a thousand each day if you're hunting the right ones. Oh, I mean, Jared nailed it on the head. Honestly, three fish out of a hundred would be good a lot of days. I mean, it's unbelievable like it, it doesn't make the fish eat this is the thing that like again going back to the people that haven't truly used it that i feel is something they think they think that like oh he's got a live scope every fish he sees and casts to he catches like it's nowhere near that easy it's great to like see where your bait is if you're fishing brush piles or like rock piles on a point like okay cool i saw my baits going down to that area i know i'm gonna have a good cast here and i'll be able to pull through all that cover and i see fish on it but it's like not a guarantee those fish will eat like i'll say 99 percent of the time they don't why is it in the industry with all of its issues and 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 you know forgive me if i've, I've already kind of asked this question already this is the hill people want to die on. It's not that baits are more expensive, entry fees are going up, gas prices are too expensive, a brand new boat. If you buy that Icon boat, Ikea boat, it's like $200,000. We don't want to complain about that, but this is the hill that we want to die on. I guess it's just like the most current common thing people can complain about if they don't have it. It is. like There's always... I don't know. I think fishermen just like to cry about something always, no matter what it is. Um, and right now, this is just one of those things because so many people do have it. But then on the other hand, there's still obviously quite a few people that do not have live scope. So it's like the first excuse that they turn to to like, oh, this is why I did shitty in this tournament because I didn't have live scope and all these guys are live scoping fish. That's my assumption. Matt, I mean, thank you so much for for taking so much time out of your schedule to uh, you know to call into the show, uh, guys. That was a heck of a follow up from uh, Boyd Junior. Uh, Matt of SB Fishing again, you know, like and subscribe to his channel there on Facebook. He uh, he knows a thing or two about forward facing sonar, so it's really cool to get you know his perspective on this whole argument because it's dude, it's insane how fast oh, it blew up. Lost you there. Um, but yeah, Matt, thank you so much again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have seven voicemails, so I'm going to get to the next few callers here. Uh, but thanks again. Anytime, dude. Talk to you. Talk to you. Bye. All righty. We're going to go to our next caller here. Caller, who, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Jeff, uh, calling from Centerville. Jeff, how are you doing? All right. How are you doing tonight? Oh, better than I deserve. So what are your thoughts on the whole, uh, this hot topic? <laughs> You've had a lot of pros. I'm not for it at all. Not, not at least on the pro level. And I, I may be an older guy, but the way I look at it is, is the young guys take it away, see how good they are. Or the, you know, these boats, you're talking about the icon boat, you know, that thing's 145 plus your trolling motors, plus your lithium batteries. Now you get into all your grass. It's not fishing. It's, it's technology. And when does this just become people watching screens and then soon have automatic casting, automatic reeling in? And when does it stop being a sport and just a computer game that you're watching? What, what do you think the cutoff should be? <clears throat> that's a that you know that's a tough question because I do believe that electronics. There is a point of electronics that should be used. Obviously, I think there's safety involved in it. You know, I, and I watched Greg Hackney even said it the other day on another podcast. I watched they're fishing in spots that they have never fished before because they're finding them with this stuff. So, the, and the weights have gone up. So there, there there does have to. Be, I do think electronics have their place and i you know i think they're great for the recreational because you do want to go out you want to catch them you want to be efficient but for the high-end tournaments 
I, you know, I, I just, I, I, some of this, uh, 360 in this forward facing sonar, I think it's just getting to a point where when does it jump the shark? When does it become more of a tech world than an actual sporting event? And that's, and that's really the ultimate question. Cause I do think it has a place, but I, I just don't think when you're talking about at some high late, uh, level, it, you know, and that's why John Cox is one of my favorites. <laughs> if you, yes. if you watch the last tournament, he gave his graphs, uh, to Matt Airy, Matt Airy, cause he forgot him. He just doesn't even use them. I think it was the last tournament he won on the tackle warehouse tour. Um, I think was it Smith like a couple years ago, like Lawrence gave him the forward facing sonar, but he forgot to put it on his boat and he won it with a damn swim jig. He won the whole event with a swim jig. And he's like, yeah, I left it in, I left it in my truck. I didn't install it yet. I mean, he's a, he's, he's freaking awesome. <laughs> his whole style. <laughs> It is, and it's cool, and it's, you know, that, that I like following him. So, you know, it's a tough question. You're going to, you know, I don't think, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the answer is. I just think, you know, at some point, hey, it, it's, you, you do it. There's got to be a cutoff, and where that is, I have no clue yet either. So what if they did this where you're only allowed two graphs? You can have as much technology as you want, but you only get two, one 12-inch graph up front, one 12-inch graph in the back. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll be quite frank with you. I, you know, I may not be the best person to ask about how much technology to have on there because I have, I have literally, I have a 2005 nitro with the original trolling motor and the original, uh, Lawrence graph that I call pong. Cause it's literally black and white and Tetris, you know, it looks like Tetris. <laughs> And, you know, hey, I, 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 I'm fine. Like, for me, I do do some tournaments, and I'm not a great, you know, tournament guy. But I do it for the, you know, hey, I can't play football. I can't play baseball. I'll, I'll blow out my back and knees in a week. Um, so I, I like to go out there. I like to find them. Um, but that, you know, one, one graph on the front and back. Like I said, I do think there needs to be technology for the safety, especially when these guys go out on water and they've never been on there before. I 100% like you do need technology and it is. And I think this is like something we can all agree on. We're going to get to the point where we have to have caps on the sport. We do. We need to have caps. And I think the scary thing is with technology advancing in the way it is. I mean, Lord, everyone knows if everyone that's listening um, or watching like AI and how that's blown up, like we're getting to a point that we do need to put caps on. But it, it what is that? And, and to me, I don't know. Like, do if you put a cap on it, how much is that going to hurt the anglers when it comes to sponsorship? If you tell Lawrence and Garmin, no more technology, it stops here. What is that going to do to them? Is that going to yeah. dry up money in the industry? But here's the thing. All right, so Garmin and Lawrence, uh, but you still got the boats that, you know, all the boats, and then there's a gazillion different lures. I mean, when you look at their shirts and you look at the overall, maybe – Maybe the Garmin, the Rants, those are the biggest money makers or thing, but there's so, there's a gazillion other sponsors. And, you know, I, you know, what's best for the sport? That's, that's the biggest question. I mean, I, I know this is an argument that's been said, but it's, you know, hey, baseball and P, PEDs, you know, Brady Anderson hit 50 home runs when he was on the juice, couldn't hit 30 when he was off it. You know, and even though the game was more exciting because everybody was knocking home runs, what was best for the sport? And that's kind of where, you know, these, the two big organizations have got to look at this and go, what, what is the best for the sport? When does it become too much? Yeah. And, and then, I mean, to adding to that, that whole thing with the steroids and, and it, so with the steroids, the issue there was it was illegal and people still did it. Um, that's, that's part one is like, it was against the law to do that. Um, whereas forward facing, but, but technically it, but technically it wasn't against the rules in baseball. You were not allowed to some use... of those guys oh, go for it. Some of the, yeah, the, some of those guys, they didn't get in trouble if they apologized for using the substance but it was a basically don't ask, don't tell until, you know, then it just became too much. And, 
you saw 120 guys pumping up to 250. It was nuts. Yeah, and that was because, again, it was it illegal? Yes, it was. But just because something is illegal doesn't mean the organization does anything about it. I mean, if we want to go into baseball talk, guys, we'll be doing this, going back to Mark McGuire back in the 1990s. So turn out and we flip up to baseball stuff. And then you had the Sammy Sosa steroid area with, with him and Mark McGuire going at it ham to ham. And then Barry Bonds blew it out of the water when his head grew three sizes. And he went from, like, what, 6'3 to, like, six, eight. I mean, yeah. And, and that, that I see where you're coming from with, with the argument about like, it did completely change the sport though. When people used it, it changed how, how you pitch to batters. It changed ballparks. It changed, it changed the lineup really um, a lot. So I completely understand where you're coming from uh, with that and not to get too much into the weeds and make this a two hour baseball talk. But yeah, I a hundred percent see where you're coming from with that and, and live scope changed it. And you know, side scan when that came in there and i think it was alton jones one on hartwell back in the day with that it changed it and then spot lock which really is weird that doesn't get as much stuff about spot lock and power poles and how much that changed it no one talks about and i'm not saying like it's a bad thing but that no one talks about how much that has changed i can't live without having power poles just to like dock my boat by myself it's really nice just for that <laughs> stupid little thing um but it's all technology. You'll it's never technology. want to go fishing with me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hate my boat because I don't have I don't have spot lock, which is driving me nuts, and I don't have power poles. <laughs> well, uh, but, but before I let you go, Jeff, if you could pick between having spot lock or power poles, which one would you want on your boat? Oh, uh, with my boat, what I have, I take the spot lock. Ooh, okay. Why? Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I'm going to be getting it, so. I, I bought my boat literally one year ago, August, and it's the first new to me boat. It's an 18, uh, 18 footer NX 82 with a 115 on the back. So, uh, with full live wells, full tank and somebody else in there, it, it, I got to go stop with the wash, get me up. So I can't put power poles on the back. It's just too heavy. Dude, Jeff. Well, Thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate the insight. And guys, yeah, you see, we finally got we finally got somebody else's opinion here that's on the other side of the fence here, which is awesome. Please feel free to call in. Uh, I'll be throwing the number back on the screen. Jeff, thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Have a good night. You too. And there you have it. That is awesome. And then we got we got Phil say, show the screen. Phil, what are you talking about here? Let's get through some some of all these conversations here. I have we had up to 40 people. I mean, Lord, this is a hot topic. Uh, I have a phone call because I got another guest that's coming in. Um, sorry. And then we're going to actually wave to her. So say hi. She's the one. I know she's short. Uh, hold on a second. Lowering the desk for the midget. So, yeah, she's running the phone right now with our really primitive phone calling system that honestly is working pretty well tonight. I'm kind of shocked by it. All right. So we have another Matt that we're going to be talking to right now. Um, uh, boy, don't worry. We'll get you back on the show. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All righty. So, guys, um, we have another guy that supposedly has used forward-facing sonar once or twice. Uh, he has paid his mortgage <laughs> on a certain body of water. I think it's called the Res or Aquaquan Reservoir. Matt McCluskey, or as I have, for some reason, I have uh, lovingly called you as Mr. McCluskey at this point. God knows how many yes. times I messed that up. But, Matt, <laughs> thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, I mean, the floor is yours. I mean, I'm assuming you've been listening in to everything that's been going on. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to keep up with everything that's going on with the Elite Series and stuff. It's just, it's so hard to get information because they don't want to tell us anything. With like, it's it, you'll get little snippets of like, oh, these pros, certain pros are complaining, but you really have to like dig into social media to figure out like what's really going on. But I don't know. With the my opinion there's kind of two trains of thought on it it's the polls that matt posted on instagram earlier in the week like it's what's more annoying forward-facing sonar or people whining about forward-facing sonar or like uh, just it, it's just hilarious it's just the but the two trains of thought are do you just not like it or do you just not like watching it on live and the guy phil who commented just before you we got on the, on the call he said show the screen I think the, the way they fix how live has been over the last three events, because all the drama really started when the Elite Series took the Northern Swing, yeah. I think. I mean, it's kind of just been boiling, but when they go up north for Smallmouth and 
you don't have 21 pounds, you're not even getting a check and covering expenses for driving 14 hours from Tennessee or wherever up to Michigan, you know, but, um, the show, the screen is they need to get, figure out something with sponsorship to get Lawrence and Garmin and Humminbird to show the screen, like see what the anglers are looking at. Cause I feel like that would change a lot of people's opinions on it. Cause most people who have an opinion on it don't know really what it, what it does. So it's just, if people were actually able to see it and see how difficult it truly is, then I think some opinions may be changed, but I I'm, I'm on the side of it's extremely boring to watch guys just stare at their screen for six hours. And then all of a sudden they reel down and you hear the spinning rod drags start coming out. So it's so interesting because I mean, even Matt brought it up. Um, you know, guys, I'll say like, so I'll say SB cause y'all know that. Cause I can't just say Matt said this and the other Matt said, that. so let's go SB. What SB was talking about was, uh, guys go to his story. I think it might still be there, but, um, looking at guys, looking at two day sonar and Lake Erie, either way you are looking at the screen and you're on bottom mm-hmm. of the water where there's nothing you're looking at. You're in the middle of a yeah. damn ocean and you're looking at this dude. So even if you didn't have a graph in front of you, what the hell are they supposed to be looking at? There's nothing there. It's all the same, especially when you're Mm -hmm. on Lake Erie, St. Clair, the St. Lawrence, these big open oceans. And because there's about 7,000 people making baseball comments, another thing there is baseball had this issue because it was boring, and they're trying to do some kind of change there and adjustment. And I think you're 100% right. If they can figure out the technology to where you can pair that to the screen, um, that would be a game changer if you could watch exactly what they're seeing. And we have mm-hmm. Brian, let's see, Brandon, uh, let's see, uh, four facing sonar will most likely not be banned in the competitive side of bass fishing. Most of the neg- negativity about it comes from the guys who doesn't have it or understand how to use it. Everyone wants 100%. If everyone wants to be a winner. Having forward facing sonar doesn't automatically make you a winner. It's an advantage for sure, but it allow it it's allowed and doesn't break any rules. The guy who is putting it in his time on the water, doing his homework and staying focused is the is the guy who's going to come out on top. Well said, sir. Well said. Yeah, I mean he just hit hit the nail on the head with that. But I mean the last, the last two fountainhead tournaments, we've got third place and second place, and we've lost the guys who aren't using live scope. So it's not an automatic. Oh, you're getting, you're winning. I mean, we've we've done well, and it's helped in the last couple of events tremendously. But it's like it's it's not a guarantee that we're going to win, or anybody who has got live scope is going to win because most people most people have it at this point. Yeah, and that's SB fishing. Matt says I, I caught one Sunday on second when Ace was up front. Yeah. Um, so what do you think it should be banned? Do you think there should be limits at the lower levels compared to the pros? Like, what are your thoughts about that when you structure it down from the pros down to the single A level? Um, the pros, it'll never be banned because there's too much money coming in from Garmin, Lawrence, and Humminbird for them to sponsor Bassmaster. And that's how they pay, pay all their employees. They pay the payouts. Like it'll never go away on the, um, the elite level and like MLF and stuff. I don't, I don't think personally, but I'm um, on the lower level. I mean, it's a discussion that needs to be had within the clubs and what people are willing to do, because I mean, a lot of guys are weekend anglers because not only because they don't have the time, but you can't afford to travel state to state. I mean, this, it's an expensive sport. Like it's, it is very expensive to travel and fish these tournaments and stuff. And I, I don't know. I feel I, 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 I can't say I don't want it to be allowed and I want it to be allowed. I mean, I love using it, but there's times where I'm just, I do think like it would be nice if we went back to when we didn't have to use this. Why? It, it, I I think the previous caller made the comment. It's like, it's just, it becomes too much sometimes. It's just like, I want to, I want it to go back to just like not knowing the whole fishing, fishing used to be, you have no idea what you, what you're about to catch. Like you, you could you could say, oh, it feels like a bluegill biting, and set the hook, and it's a six pounder. But on live scope, if I see the fish, I mean, you can't exactly tell how big the fish is, but you know if it's a bigger than average fish. So like, you could we, you could see a fish on live scope sixty feet out, and your heart starts pumping already because you're like, oh my gosh, that's a big one. Like we, that's a fish that 
could win a tournament, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's taken, it's definitely taken some of the guessing aspect out of it. Cause I mean, obviously you can pull up on a spot and put the troll motor in the water. And if there's no fish, like you said earlier, leave, like there's no reason to fish it. So it's, it's, I think it's taken away from the traditional aspect of fishing in a big way, but so, I mean, oh my God. You're, uh, we got, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm positive and negative on the whole live scope thing. I think it was interesting with one of our callers earlier when, when they said like, you know, if I have to buy a brand new boat, that's over a hundred thousand dollars. And then I have to buy, I'm losing. Boat. I lost you. Hold on. And you hear me? Yep. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Now I got you. Sorry. Perfect. No, you're good. Um, I think it was interesting. One of our callers earlier was talking about, if I have to buy a brand new boat, that's a surprise. And I have to buy all this stuff at this price. I, I don't want to have to buy also live scope, which is a very interesting idea of pondering it. But to me, it's like with that mindset, why do we have to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a boat? You know, look at the kayak industry. If I want, I could buy a brand new kayak, pimp it out. And I'm under 10 grand with everything, 10 grand with everything pimped out. Yeah. Why is it? The conversation is live scope is bad. I don't want to call pay that money but I'm okay with forking over a hundred thousand dollars for a brand new boat. That makes no sense to me where people are disconnected that the Phoenix brand new, it's fine buying that, but I don't want to buy the black box for live scope. That to me is just very weird. I will say I'm fishing all the Potomac tournaments and I haven't fished BFLs really since live scope came or came around. Cause I'm a co-angler and, but um, I mean, most of the boats have it now. Like, I, I don't, I don't think it's for, for bass boat fishing, like unless you're fishing just a Wednesday night tournament and that's all you do. But like, if you're fishing a trail on a body of water, I would, a lot of boats have it now the, minus the Potomac river. Cause you don't need it. Like it's, unless it's the springtime and there's not a lot of grass and even it, in the spring when the grass is coming up, it's useless on the Potomac river. In my opinion, there's too many catfish and carp unless, unless it's in the spring. And you can actually see, but, um, and percentages, honestly, like, so example is on the Potomac river, what percentage of the catch will be that? Like, so let's say if you're at the res at the prime time for it, maybe it, it accounts for 50% of the fish that you put in your boat versus the Potomac. It might be like what? Uh, 1% less than yeah. that. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I, and I think people need to understand that. And a guy in the comment section later on said like, well, I won one Thursday night. I did, but the tournament I won, I didn't even use a live scope because the fish were suction to the bottom. You couldn't see it. Like mm -hmm. I've caught two fish in that tournament series this summer that I saw. So just because you have it doesn't mean like percentage wise, this body of water, it's going to equal this amount of catch. Yes. You, you got, you have to put a tremendous amount of time into it for it to truly like get that, get your catch percentage where you look at 50% of the fish that you're working in. And that's, that's a crazy number to begin with, but um yeah but back back to the the cost of it it's like most bass boats at this point have it i mean the new the newer ones at least i mean if you're buying a 2020 2021 boat or newer from a dealership most of them are going to try and upsell or already have installed the live scope for, to it so it's just it, it's never going away that's that that's that's the thing that people need to understand i think is the the genies the genies out of the bottle here it is. And again, I just come back to this comment I saw on somebody's Facebook about uh, unfair advantage. And it's, I want to ban live scope because it's an unfair advantage. But if I'm a pro, I can get a brand new Phoenix boat for free, which means I get the whole Phoenix big bass bucks. So I can fish a BFL and then I'm going to win $10,000 off of that because I got a free sponsored boat for two years. That advantage is fine. We're going to allow that, but mm -hmm. the live scope is not allowed. Or if you are a guide and you get to fish the BFLs or jackpot tournaments, that's allowed. And I'm not saying whether that should be or should not, but if you're going to take that and that's your argument, well, that can be, you can apply that in so many ways. And that's Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. When you say like, oh, this is too much of an advantage like that. There's got to be more to it. Yeah. I don't know. This is just crazy controversial topic right now, it seems. And it's just, it's reached the boiling point. And now everybody's just like, what is going on in bass fishing right now? So, and bass, uh, we got Thomas, uh, I apologize for your last name here, but Thomas, uh, uh, Roby, Ruby, uh, Bassmaster Elite AOI, Kyle Wetcher credited, uh, forward facing sonar to for his title. He admitted that mm -hmm. without it, he had no chance. Does that make him the best angler? What do you think? Um, so, if 
he did. Um, I assume he watched Kyle Welcher posted a video, but just but everybody's been doing posting videos about the whole forward facing sonar thing. And Hunter, his wife asked him, do you think, do you attribute all that? Or do you think you could have done this without live scope? And Kyle made the comment with everybody has live scope. Y yes. I obviously he did it. And he said, if everybody doesn't have live scope, my chances would go down, but I would still have a chance to do it. So, it's the the whole I get there's certain people who just have success because of live scope or have learned it well, but it does like you have to have skill as a fisherman to use it correctly. Mm -hmm. Like it it's it's it doesn't fix everything. Like if you're not on the water and you don't understand like what is going on and you just you don't have just good fishing intuition to begin with, like it's not gonna be everything. Yeah. And guys, oh. I, I, I hate to go down this. That guy got me thinking about the whole baseball thing with the steroids. The, <laughs> issue, the issue there was when you had great athletes taking an illegal substance to make themselves superhuman. Joe Schmo taking steroids did not help him. He still sucked. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't think people understand about the whole steroid issue. Right. It's like it, I think this kind of goes into your argument. Just because you took the steroids or have live scope, it doesn't matter. You need to have that set of skill that it enhances. And that's what's yeah. so crazy about live scope or steroids is good anglers became better. Yes. And it that and it a hundred percent took some anglers who were middle of the pack and the guys who grasped it the most and it shot them to the top. So I mean it's it it helps guys big time and then it hurts the guys who are not willing to learn it at the elite level and whatever level it is if there's clubs getting dominated by forward facing sonars like people not wanting to learn it as much as the the one guy you know that's that's my take on it and, and yeah and oh we got a, this is a good message here forward facing uh, this is from andrew redding forward facing sonar is just another tool i agree it's boring to watch but so is 11 pounds in the sabine what needs to happen is mlf and bass need to spice it up and show the screen I think mm -hmm. there's a, I think they would if they had a the technology. I, they have the technology. They've done it already. To put it on every single boat? No, I would I mean I would assume it would be able to be on every single boat because they're only they're only doing six live cameras. So it, I mean, yeah. it it just needs to be on the six boats and I mean it could be as easy as the thing you plug into the USB on the the back graph. So mm -hmm. if you have a Lorance on the front and then a Lorance on the dash you just plug it into the Lorance on the on the dash and share the screen from the front to the back, and Bassmaster can stream that. In the classic, when Jeff Gustafson was scoping all those smallmouth in the canals, there was a few clips of it. I remember on Santee Cooper, you could see um, Brandon Polinick. He caught a fish out of a brush pile on it. But the problem is, is Bassmaster is specifically sponsored by Humminbird, and MLF is specifically sponsored by Lorance, and a lot of guys use Garmin. Boom. Yeah. So it, it it's it's all this is coming down to is money. Is I get Bassmaster right now is probably just thinking how do we figure out how to get these either all these guys on the same page and we pay them according to Humminbird, which would be absolutely absurd because the Humminbird Mega Live is garbage. But and compared to Garmin and Lawrence, but um, yeah, I agree. It's terrible, man. I just. I mean, they got the the turret idea I like, and I don't know why Garmin hasn't come out with their own turret yet. I think that concept is cool, but yeah, I think it's cool. It's cool if you have if you have spot lock and it's really windy. That's the only situation for me that I would think I would prefer it. But Cause doesn't just, it doesn't let you switch between using the foot pedal and then locking onto brush piles and stuff. It, it yeah, I mean, it, it could certainly help. But I my the, I fished a tournament on the Potomac today, and the guy who had it, it just added so much weight to his troll motor. He had the three sixty and the turret on it. Mm. I tried. To, I went to look, lift up his Ultrax. I was like, Jesus. But I mean, it, it it you can if you have it on the foot pedal, it's for me. It's this, it's better just because I like having the direct contact. Now, if it's locked with the the direction of the foot pedal, like it's fine. But it's just an added thing, in my opinion. Just because uh, having that direct contact with it and being able to swing it freely is really what has helped. Because people, I fish with a lot of people who are relatively novice with it, and they'll they'll point it over at something and be like, "Oh, there's a fish over there," and then they'll look away from it. It's like the if you truly want to 
like you get good at it, you have to continue to stare at it. And it, it's messed up. And I hate saying that, but it's mm-hmm. the truth. And it's just like, I've seen people just turn like, Oh yeah, there's a brush pile. There's a, the, there's the fish. And they go back to the traditional. Okay. I'm going to cast over there. At least it at least helped me see where the structure was, but the make the 360 would do the same thing. The live was for figuring out why the fish want to don't want to bite your bait or they're reacting to a certain bait or a certain color or something something like that but sorry i got off on a tangent no no, no that's good because like that's something so i have uh, i have an altrex i have the garmin uh live scope and i also have mega 360 and the one thing that i've noticed is you know you don't always have to shine it on them to like i'll because i've seen this like they start spooking and i'll push it away and then make the cast and then i'll know kind of how they react to it stuff like that and i think that's just interesting because yeah you're going to use it to to see how they react to the bait but there's also other times where i just cast in their generic area Mm -hmm. and i'm going to know like it's not always you're going to stare at the thing come up and eat it and you're going to have success Um, Mm -hmm. and i think I, at least the novice people I know they're misleaded that every single fish that you catch on live scope is literally, you saw the thing, put the bait in his mouth. And that no. hasn't always been the case for me. No, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not the case. I mean, you, you, you can throw over there and just realize, know that there's some fish over there. Like in the Lake Anna winter series is a good example for me. It's like, we, we hadn't fished the lake, but and at all me and my partner chris Silberti hadn't fished the lake at all and we went down there last winter and we had really good success and it was because of forward facing sonar but i would be on the front panning around and chris basically just fan casted a jig and i could confirm that there was fish on spots and he beat he beat my ass standing behind me i would just be like yeah they're over in that general direction and i it was hard for me to get fish to bite down there and watch them eat because that's a lake that's been heavily pressured by the live scope. And I've heard it's got even worse yeah. since last winter. So those, those fish are certainly starting to react to it. So, and Oh, that's, that's another, that's another point. People say that live scope is forcing fish off of the bank. I heard that in a Facebook thread this week. I saw somebody posted that if anything, live scope should be making it easier for people that are fishing the bank because it should be driving the fish off of, out of the, deep structure up to the bank where they're not going to feel that sonar in their face constantly. So I, I mean, over time, if you're a bank fisherman, the fish are coming to you. So no, hundred percent. I'm sorry. I saw this comment for Phil. 360 is, un, is, is underrated. Yeah, it is. I, I like, I think 360 and spot lock is more important for the way I fish. Cause I like boat control. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. mind chasing a fish with live scope, but it gets annoying as hell when I'm trying mm-hmm. to lock a cast on and I have to then, take it off spot lock to look at the fish versus yep. I can look at the brush pile. Let's say and there's fish on it. I'll put spot lock on and then I'll use my 360 line, at my cast and I can hit a couple of casts and then I'll go back to maybe scoping it versus fighting the wind and current and crap. Cause that just gets <laughs> old after a while. Yeah. It, 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 it can be, it, it can be really difficult doing that, but I don't want to take up all your time. We've been on the phone for a while. Oh, you're, you're fine boss again, guys. Um, yeah, I'll try to link his stuff also in the episode description. Uh, that is Matt McCluskey. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and just kind of giving your words of wisdom here on the subject. I appreciate it. I wouldn't call it wisdom, but <laughs> I, gave my, I gave my two cents, but all right, be good. Thanks for having me on. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. All righty, guys, the the phone line is back open. So if you want to call in and just talk about this show, we're going to be going here just for another couple of minutes here because I have about 6 billion comments I have to get through. And just like Nerd Rotic, uh, from Gary from Nerd Rotic, every message will be answered, even if I have to do a super chat catch-up show. We will make sure every question is actually answered. And next time, I'm going to have to have you on another computer just to be able to like highlight all these. Uh, actually, yeah, you could take it. And then, yeah, if you guys want to call in, let me get the number back up here for you. If you want to call into the show, the number is 240-542-9877. Again, please feel free to call in. We've had a couple of great callers talking about the pros and the cons of it. I, I think it's interesting, the, the, you know, the evolution of where this is be- going to be going and how mad people are about having this live scope. It, but yet there's other things. And I, you know, I forgot the time and I just remembered I was going to ask Matt this actually when he was on the show, uh, you know, five seconds ago, you know, P- the people that learned how to use this technology survived. And I think another great example of that it was when Major League Fishing first became a thing and they had this policy called Every Fish Counts. You caught every single fish and it counted with if it was over a pound or whatnot. 
And you know what's crazy? There are professional anglers that you know that absolutely sucked at that foreign man. Brandon Polinick, Gerald Swindle. People love Gerald Swindle, but he sucked at catching every fish. He was dog shit at it. And you know what happened? These people started to complain and they left and they went to bass. And there were some anglers like a Jacob Wheeler that if it's every fish counts, I'm still going to win. If it's five fish, I'm still going to win. It was a different format, but there were some people that rose to the occasion with all the sonar. There are some people that rise to the occasion and then we can kind of get into the idea of like, uh, should there be a technology band? I don't really know. Um, I don't know when the cutoff should be like the whole thing was cutting 360 off, but we're going to let like spot lock. Do we agree? Spot lock should stay. Should 360 stay good GPS coordinates. I think that's a safety thing. We should probably keep that on the boats side scan. That should stay right. What about trolling motors that cost $5,000? We haven't even brought that up. You know, Garmin's new trolling motor or not Garmin power poles, new trolling motor, Minn Kota's new trolling motor. Both of them are close to $5,000. That's okay. Power poles are those okay? I, I don't know. It's just it's an interesting conversation. Um, you're hundred percent correct on the on the MLF that one that left. Yeah, it's just the people that sucked at MLF left the left MLF and went back to bass. It was a different format that they couldn't do. Oh, we got another caller here, guys. Hello, caller. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Uh, what, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Steve Baker from Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? Good, real good. Yeah, so I, I put it in the comments too, but this is just more out of like curiosity. And sorry if it was already covered, but um, how would how would it how could it work if um, mm -hmm. if it was allowed, you know, for pre fishing and stuff, and then during tournament hours they cut it off or did not use it? I think what is so fascinating about that is, it, okay, you could find a cove that fish. Let's say let's say you're in the. Ah, uh, you're kind of cutting off. Can you hear me now? Let's say it's it's the fall somewhere and uh, you're chasing bait fish in pockets. So you're able to yeah. find shad on Thursday in the back of a pocket. Cool. You caught them there. Mm -hmm. well, you saw them all. Great. You waypoint that pocket and then you go out there on, on, on the day of the tournament and you don't have it. I mean, that's kind of old information. You're going based off of old information. Now, granted, that would be kind of like the, the way that it used to be in fishing. You're not going off of, of information right now in the now. I think that's interesting because I don't, I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want to know that would yeah. make me fish history more if I only had it right. two days ago versus now. Right. And I honestly feel like that's what makes live scope. That's where I enjoy live scope more is not seeing fish. It's getting the data of knowing, are they up in the water column? Are they down? Are they chasing the bait? Or are they not? And I've, mm -hmm. I've only caught a handful of fish all year that were like, I saw it take the bait. I had a big tournament yeah. at, at Raystown Reservoir in PA in early. It was, it was early March and it was cold as hell. And I remember the one place that I found them in, I didn't see bass on the screen, but I saw bait and that mm -hmm. told me to stay there. And I ended up catching them on a blade bait. Never saw them actually take the bait because they were sandwiched at the bottom. It was so cold. It was snowing the day before. But the, okay, only, okay, but, yeah. but the, the only reason I knew to stay there was like, well, clearly there's bait here. So there's got to be fish. Yeah. A and that was right. great information that told me to stay. A and and so just going with that, I think that's a really cool thing that, that you brought up because I, I believe there's someone else that brought it up in the comment section as well. If you did that, would it give you a benefit? And comment section down below, what do you think? Would it give you a benefit if you just had it in practice, but not in the tournament? I feel like it would force me to fish way too much history because I'd be like, oh, yeah, it was here yesterday. Therefore, I need to make it work. Yeah. I mean, and to your point, too, like come tournament day, if, if the person, like if that particular angler was so dependent on using some type of active sonar uh, or that, you know, active imaging, you know, if they came up complete bust and could not literally catch a fish off that, does that mean anything? I think it would definitely mean something if you took it away immediately. So example, like the MLF comment mm -hmm. I just made, uh, the people, there are some anglers that seem like if it's every fish counts or if it's five fish, they kill it. They're great. I think if you took live scope, right. away, yeah, you would see real quick, who are the anglers that they need it to be successful versus the, I guess, all time greats that, they're going to catch them with it. And they're going to catch them without it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think, I think what stirred that, that, uh, that initial thought was, 
hearing some of the uh, elite guys talk about, you know, if, if that was not available to some of the maybe newer anglers that had gotten into their tournament trail these last couple of years or whatever, um, if you did in fact take that away, how big of an impact would it make on their, you know, not just their style, but like their, their results, you know, their results were directly correlated to that. So, um, yeah, that, that, that answers it though. I, was, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but yeah, that was cool. Steve. Yeah, I know. Thank you so much uh, for calling in. Cause that's a really good question to have about whether to use it for that. So, but thank you so much. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good night. You too. Again, guys, the number is two, four, zero, five, four, two, nine, eight, seven, seven, using it for pre-fishing or not. That is a very interesting idea. Let's see, Phil, uh, Phil, uh, dude, I Phil, I didn't even ever ask you in person what your last name is. Uh, Phil Mihagen, I guess, Carly, what is his name? Phil Mahagan. Phil Mahagan. There you go. I don't want to do uh, Bakoy again. I don't want to have that as an issue. If you throw a glide bait, they'll eat it on live every time. All right, Phil. There you go. That's how he pimps some product out. We got Thomas Ruby here. Forward facing is is future. Change my mind. LOL. Okay, there you go. You can't you can't really top that. Uh, we got he's not wrong. I just bought another setup for a boat for a boat build. Uh, Thirty five hundred. Dang, that's insane. Again, guys, call in number is is down below. I'm going to be popping that back up on the screen here. Call in number is 240-542-9877. I'm going to be taking about one or two more calls, and then we'll, and they're going to be calling it a night here. Um, so sorry, this was already covered, but is it possible to pre-fish with it and not allow tournament dates? Not hating or just curious? I, I think that's a fantastic uh, – yeah, I'm, Steve, I'm so glad that we actually covered that. What do you say? Oh, I just talked to him. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sometimes you get all confused with all this stuff. Um, let's see here. Forward facing center live scope, uh, rests or copies. Uh, I'm for it, just not the elites. What about the opens, AAA, lower level? Hold on, what? Forward facing sonar is live scope. The rest are copies. I'm for it, just not the elites. Why? So you don't at the top levels, but the lower levels. That makes no sense. So you want to have it so you train to use it all the way up, but in the pros, you're not allowed to use it. That makes I would I would flip it around, Thomas. You know, the pros should be allowed to have it because it pushes money into everyone's pockets because they need the money to survive. But then you have lower tournament. Or if you want to have a local club and you don't want to have it, that's perfectly fine. It's called capitalism, baby. One club doesn't have it, one does, and we'll see who's more successful. That's just kind of how that works. I love it. Um, King Fanning... Ah, I've been talking too long. I'm going to dry my lips with some satanic water, liquid death. King pin sport fishing one. Hummingbird has the HDMI port. I can say that, but not some people's names. The HDMI port on the top end of the unit. They do. Um, let's see here. We got uh, just hummingbird has the tech. Yeah, I think more places do it. I think an interesting thing Matt said, uh, Matt McCluskey was, I think the interesting thing was the fact that hummingbird does really push bass. And I think this is an issue when it comes to this next comment here, which is talking about like the Sabine. The reason they go to the Sabine is because they get paid. Clearly that place really, really sucks. Um, I don't, I, you know, they go there for the money. The hummingbird pushing the product is because of the money. That's why hummingbird sponsors bass. I think bass and major league fishing need to get to the point where they're not reliant on the government, the government money. Sorry. Another, another topic for another day, um, relying on the company's money so that they can actually push out a good product. They shouldn't be sponsored directly by any of the forward facing sonar brands. That way they can actually uptake that. And I think they are kind of caught in a catch 22. Do you take the money by a certain brand, but then you don't display it, but then the product sucks, but then they don't want the product. So it's a negative feedback loop. Um, that is really interesting. Again, guys, two, four, zero, five, four, two, nine, eight, seven, seven. Last call, last call of the night. Uh, our local club on the river doesn't allow it, which is fine because I can find them on the down scan. That's absolutely amazing there. Uh, Carly, who is this person right here? Uh, it says Roger that old comments are loading from our convo delayed for some reason. Huh? Oh, okay. I'm talking about, okay. Gotcha. Uh, actually hummingbird had a lot of ads in the last few MLF events. Oh, Ed, Mark, sorry, Mark. Thank you so much. I did not know that my apologies, but I think, I think it's a very good argument that they need to be like, it's a, it's a feedback loop though. It's basically they're sponsored by one brand, so they can't 
have the feed showing all the brands. And because they don't have the feed, that would probably make the viewing better. And so because they don't have that feed, people are complaining about live scope, which is probably going to kill the sale of live scope, I guess. So what they really should do is not take the money and then figure out a way for all the brands to be able to like stream it. And I think that's got to be a unanimous thing through all these or like all these brands that listen, if we can figure out a way to do this, it helps all of us. It's a rising tide that actually like lifts all boats. Um, give Marty a call. Yeah, give Marty Lawson a call. Because I know Marty wanted to come on earlier and actually talk about this stuff. Uh, we're talking about show the screen. I got that one up there too. I'm going to have to do like a super chat catch up here. Uh, hitting a baseball like a superhuman is different than seeing grainy images of fish and still having convinced them to bite. I, I get the idea with it with the steroids though, specifically where it makes a good athlete great. It, uh, live scope is the same thing if you know absolutely how to use it. I 100% agree with that right there. Uh, we got Phil. Uh, Baseball needs roids for it to be mildly interesting. That's not true. Baseball is still extremely interesting. Um, um, but again, guys, I really think like with baseball, I think because again, that's literally how I made all my money with teaching kids and coaching for like 16 years. You know, baseball is still interesting. Baseball's biggest issue right now is not evolving and trying to make the game quicker, which is kind of what Bass is going through now that people are not watching it as much as they used to, which is kind of interesting there. Uh, we got a oh, and then we got right here. Got Garmin and Lawrence make the most money per sale versus Rapala striking. Set. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Bring back Boyd. We'll we'll bring back Boyd at a later episode. We got one more coming here. However, watching the elites can absolutely be a bore, especially with recent tournaments in the northern fisheries. Well, that's where they actually absolutely have to change up their scheduling. They need to change up their scheduling if this is an issue to where they're not going to those fisheries back to back to back. Can they do that? I don't think logistically they will because you're not going to go from Champlain to Alabama back up north. You're just not going to do something like that. Um, do we have any voicemails? Carly. All right, Mark Edwards. Problem in bass fishing. The non endemic companies don't get enough money back in returns of their sponsorship. I 100% agree with that. Um, we got Nick from the POV of a complete newbie with forward facing sonar. It's a great learning tool. And I don't think anyone would deny that. I don't think it has the power of killing fisheries like some video titles claim. So. I think that's an interesting, that one, that's an interesting question. They are seeing in some crappy fisheries, they are worried about, and I'm just noticing this because forward facing sonar really has changed crappy fishing. You're able to target bigger females more than any other fish species, right? Or you're able to target female crappie way more specifically now based on how their patterns are, how you can follow them with live scopes. You can target them a little bit better. What I think would be interesting for species that you can take out of the lake, like crappie or walleye, I, I would be interested to see if live scope does have an effect on fish populations. If you get better at catching something that you want to keep, does that mean you should change it? Yeah, exactly. It's be like how many of these crappy are, are released. That's why I, that's why I think it's interesting where I think for bass fishing, that's one thing, but when the comment is made, like it's killing fisheries, well, if it's a crappie fishery and you're actually pulling them out to eat, I, I would like to see the data on that. I would really like to see the data on crappie fishing or stripe fishing or walleye fishing. Uh, SB fishing release degrees, release in degrees. Carly, am I saying this wrong? SB fishing release degrees. Release in degrees. Okay, I said that right. Fantastic. Uh, however, watching the elites can absolutely be a bore. Absolutely. Guys, I think what we're going to do here. Um, I, everyone wants him back. Uh, apparently we have to call Boyd, call Boyd. Uh, so guys, we're going to finish the show up with Boyd Duckett. They want Boyd Duckett to call back in one more time. I'm going to see if he's actually available and we're going to get Boyd on the show. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to do a super cat chat catch up show on Patreon. Again, guys, if you really want to help support the show as we grow, we just launched a Patreon. Our, huh? Yeah, absolutely.
Hey, how's it going? Hey, Boyd. Uh, we had a couple more questions for you. Oh, sure. I'm all about it. Um, after everything, have you been listening to the show at all? Uh, absolutely. Um, I was curious as your thoughts and after hearing everyone's thoughts, what do you think about forward facing sonar and where it's going from here? Well, you know, I mean, the old guard is phasing out, you know, let's be real. I mean, we already seen Kevin Van Dam retire this year. And, uh, that's honestly just the start of, you know, what we're going to see in the future. Um, I think these young guns coming up, you know, they, they've mastered the forward facing sonar and they're, they're going to kick a lot of these old guys out. You know, you might have a couple John Coxes that put up a fight, but the future is inevitable. I mean, for my tournament organization and, you know, so that's why I keep sinking money into it. Why is it you went away from all fish count that are over, let's say, a pound to a five fish? Well, you know, we tried, we tried the, uh, the all fish count thing and, you know, it just never really took off. You know, people are still hardwired to want to see that bass program. And, you know, even the uh, FLW series back in the day. So we decided to reintegrate a five fish program. Um, and it's 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 doing OK for us, you know, but hopefully in the future we can integrate more of a, a more of a freestyle program if you will i think that's actually going to be a viable thing to do if you can actually put a freestyle program in there uh, do you think all oh. the brands will ever come together hummingbird garment absolutely and brands? i mean you know bass bass the, you know they're just not they're not aggressive enough you know i mean we gotta see we gotta see business deals requiring a contract with Lawrence Humminbird, Garmin, you know, Garmin especially. But, you know, if, if you want to see your products featured on national TV, it's got to be live streamed. You know, we got we got to be able to hook that up. So, you know, we're working on bringing that in. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you'll see a lot more of that in the future uh a lot more live streaming um screen screen streaming tournament wise you know on live on national tv um bass is behind the ball on that so i think we're trying to get a jump on that before they do you made an interesting comment boyd uh again guys we have boyd jr on the show right now uh calling in again uh you made an interesting comment in the comment section below about uh boomers and and really it's the old individuals that just don't understand technology uh would you mind just kind of giving us a little bit more insight into that you know i mean goodness gracious you got rick klein out there the guy's 97 still getting it i mean he's still out there in his nitro just giving it hell i mean but the reality is the future is forward facing sonar and there's no way to get around that. You either learn it or you get left in the dust. So, you know, once um, the old guard retires, I, I mean, how can you ban forward facing sonar? Because the young guys have gotten so good at it that that makes tournaments interesting. You know, we're getting, 25 30 pound bags on places that used to get 20 pounds so i don't know i mean people are just gonna have to get used to it you know what i'm saying no 100 percent. and then we got a great comment here by uh, ken presley boyd is 100 percent on it's all about the new money they got the old money it's all about the future crackhead money 100 percent agree with that ken that's that's well spoken very poetic I mean, absolutely. I, you know, I know young guys that can slap a LVS 32 from marketplace for $600 a 
on their, you know, $3,000 rig and go out there and outfish guys that have been fishing on the lake for 25 years. They don't, they're not just sniping fish. They're finding things in the lake that lead them, you know, to winning bites. They're not, they're not just picking off fish individually. They're going, they're finding, you know, the hot creek bed, the hot rock pile, you know, all this stuff. They're finding structure. And they're, they might not even necessarily be sight casting to these fish. They're just using the forward facing sonar to get them on these hot bites. And, you know, I think that's what it's all about. So the guys that are hating on forward facing sonar, you know, I understand some of your argument points, but, you know, you either got to get with it or you're going to get left in the dust. Closing thoughts, uh, Boyd Jr. Again, guys, Boyd Jr. is on the show here to really give us insight into MLF. Um, do you, what tour stop do you think that your dad put on the schedule? Which one do you look, are you looking forward to the most? Well, I mean, are we talking BFLs? Are we talking Toyota series? Or are we talking the, um, you know, the pro series? You pick. Well, shoot. I mean, I'm really looking forward to the BFL down here on Kerr Lake. Um, I think these guys are locked and loaded. You know, they really know what's going on. And we've got a big field. This is a super tournament. we got a two-day weekend. Uh, top, what is it? Top 25 fish Saturday. I don't even know. I don't fish it. I just make the money. Um, but, you know, I think these guys are really going to find them. I think they're really going to be on it. And I think we're going to see things from Kerr Lake that we haven't seen in a minute. Um, you know, I mean, I'm talking, these guys are bringing in 13 pounds a day. I mean, we're talking weight here. So, you know, we're looking at 26 to 30 pounds to win for two days. I mean, that's a serious tournament. So I'm excited to see what these guys do, you know, and, um, you know, I hope, I hope the best man wins and I, I hope my $5 million endorsement to Garmin really pays out. Is it true that in summertime tournaments, uh, you really patented the idea of keeping frozen or really chilled cores cans in the live well to help keep the water at the right temperature see now this is something i don't like to tell everybody but the cores glass bottles hold ice better so i like to fill those up with water and freeze them pre-tournament day in the freezer while i'm pre-fishing in the lake house and uh you know i mean we're the ducats so i've got about a 1.5 million dollar lake house on you know any tour stop we go to um not to brag or anything but yeah i like to keep about uh, uh six to twelve cores light glass bottles frozen in the live well for sure while i'm tournament fishing um just just for the fish's safety and health absolutely and then um, I also like to keep six to 12 full cores bottles in the uh, the boat cooler while we're out there, just in case, you know, we need to throw more fo frozen bottles in the live well uh, just to help the fish. Now, uh, there's a quote here that I thought was very interesting that, you know, your dad, you know, did ban drinking uh, during the BFLs. And you're quoted here that in America, you should be allowed to shotgun a beer after you catch a big old uh, watermelon. Uh, what do you think about that? Absolutely. I think we should um, introduce a rule that, you know, if you weigh in and you've got the winning bag, you should be required to shotgun a beverage of your choice um, because this is America and we like to do that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I just I think it would really increase uh, fan revenue and um, engagement, you know, amongst the fans. Um, you should be required to shotgun a beer on live TV. 
I absolutely think that. And I think that's coming in the future. We're working with our lawyers right now on that. But, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's frowned upon, but th the majority is in love with it. So, you know, we're going to get it ramrodded through one day or another. Boyd, thank you so much again for coming on the Soy. Boyd Jr., everyone, I really appreciate all of your insight. And, you know, we all here would like to have you back on the show in the future. And good luck at the Kerr tournament. Absolutely. I'll be here. And uh, Bass will be out of business within five years. Mark my words. Thank you, Thomas. Have a good one. There you have it, guys. There we go. Real big words of wisdom there. Uh, again, guys, we are going to do a uh, super chat catch up show on Patreon. Again, if you really could, I'd really appreciate it. Please go follow us on Patreon. We have some major goals. We are going to be creating a nonprofit to help do stocking of all of our fisheries. So if you find it in your hearts, link to that in the episode description as well. Uh, see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens. And Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.